Okay. Now another uh, form of the shortest job first is the shortest remaining time first algorithm. And this algorithm is uh, basically is more dynamic and more adaptive than the shortest job first. So in this case, we look at the time remaining for each process. And of course, it's based on our estimate. So time remaining indicates you know, future. And we don't know the future, but we, make an, we estimate the future, or we guess. We make an, uh, an educated guess of the future. Uh, so now we are introducing two different, two new concepts. The first concept is the concept of the arrival time. So now, not all processes arrive at the same time. We have different arrival times, and the differences in arrival time here are significant. And we have the concept of preemption, where a, high, a higher priority process is going to preempt a lower priority process. Let's see how this works. So at time zero, so you have these processes with these arrival times. Now at time zero, how many processes do you have in the ready queue? Only one process. So that makes it easy. The system has no choice. Because at time zero, the other processes have not arrived yet. So the system will just give the CPU to P1. Only one choice. Now at time one, the system has two options. The two options are P1 and P2. And it's going to make a, a, a selection based on the length of the, the remaining length in the CPU burst. So it's going to look at the remaining length for P1, which is what? At time 1. What's the remaining CPU burst length for P1 at time 1? 7. Uh, because it's, the total is 8, and it has already used one unit of CPU time. So the remaining time is 7. So we're choosing between 7 and 4. The remaining time for P2 is 4. So we are comparing 7 with 4, and 4 is uh, smaller than 7. So P2 gets the CPU. So at time 1, we have preemption. P2 preempts P1. Or the system preempts P1 and gives the CPU to P2. Okay? Uh, then at time 2, the system has another option that has arrived. Now at time 2, we have three options. And what are the lengths that the system will be looking at at time 2? 7, 3, and 9. So for P1, 7. For P2? Uh, it's done. Hmm? 3. Because P2 has used 1 unit at time 2. And for P3, it's 9. So it's going to compare 7, 3, 9, and 3 wins. 3 wins means P2 keeps the CPU. So at time 2, P2 keeps the CPU. At time 3, the system will have a fourth option, which is P4. And now, the numbers that are being compared are 7 for P1, two. and two. 2 for P2, 9 for P3, and 5 for P4. And who wins? P2. P2 has the shortest remaining time, so P2 keeps the CPU again. Now at time 5, P2 will be done. Of course, you know, after time three, there will be no new arrivals. So no new arrivals, so the, the system will not have to make a, a, a new uh, selection. And the time five P2 is done. When P2 is done, uh, now the system will have to choose between the remaining processes. So the remaining time for P1 uh, is going to be seven. For P3 is 9, for P4 is 5, so who wins? P4. P4 with a 5, so the 5 is smaller than the 7, so P4 gets the CPU, then P1, then P3. Yeah. Okay, yeah, question first. Is the burst time estimated? Yeah, so, this, so, okay. yeah. we are assuming that it's estimated. Yeah. The only problem that I think I see with this is that it, so it automatically switches from process one to process two. You know, I see that because when process two comes in, now it's the shortest one. But it it ignores the context switching time to go from from one process to yeah, another. Yeah, definitely. Yes, you are absolutely right. So in this chart, in this Gantt chart, we are ignoring the 
kernel time and the context switching time. Yeah, so definitely we're not showing the kernel time, but in a real system, yeah, the system is not magic. So in order to do this switching, it will have to, uh, you know, it will have to uh, do some context switching. But that would mean that the average waiting time would, would I mean, like if you're, if you continue to switch from processes based upon how much time you think they have left, that could, uh, I'm just thinking that it, it, it could take a lot longer than you actually think if you have to continue to switch. Yes. So if we account for the context, for the context switching time, the waiting times are going to be longer. But in our study of scheduling algorithms, we're going to neglect okay. the the context switching time, the, the, the kernel time, uh, assuming that the kernel time is going to be negligible compared to the actual <laughs> bursts that are given to the uh, processes. So the, uh, the actual CPU bursts that are given to the processes are typically in the millisecond range, while the context switching time is in the microsecond. Uh, yeah. Any questions? This is subject. Fact, you know, here, you know, if you, uh, uh, you know, if you think about this, so when a, when this process arrives, it's going to interrupt the system, right? So when when process number two arrives, so when a pro when a new process arrives, what does that mean? A new process is uh, uh, is arriving at the system, so you are. Uh, as a user, you are asking the system to, uh, to, to execute this process. So this will result in an interrupt. So the system will get, the kernel will get the CPU here because the arrival of P2 is going to interrupt the system. So within the span of that P2 time, that system is getting interrupted several times. Yes, yeah, exactly. So it got interrupted at time 2, mm -hmm. and it had to make a choice. But the choice was in favor of P2, so P2 kept the CPU. And at time three, it, was, it got interrupted by P4, and it made a choice. But the choice was in favor of P2, so it managed to, to keep the CPU. But there was system intervention that we're not showing. So we're not showing system intervention. OK. Now we look at priority scheduling. So, you know, shortest job first, as we said, is a special case of a priority scheduling algorithm. But in general, the system may assign priorities for other reasons. So the priority is not necessarily based on the length of the CPU burst. There are other factors that, uh, you know, the system can, uh, can uh, set priorities based on. In fact, you know, many systems allow the user uh, to adjust the priority of a process. So on uh, Unix systems, there is the nice value that we will talk about in, uh, when we get to uh, Linux scheduling. And on Windows, you can, uh, you can raise or uh, you can set the priority of a process, but uh, you know, the system that I have doesn't allow me to set it to the highest, which is re real time. So you know the priorities is sometimes uh, the systems give the user uh, some uh, a chance to adjust the priority within certain uh, within a certain range. Uh, so this priority is encoded as a number, and in some systems, uh, you know, smaller numbers indicate higher priority, like Linux and Unix systems. Smaller number is higher priority. On other systems like Windows, as we will see, on Windows it's the other way around. So larger numbers indicate higher uh, priorities. And priority-based scheduling could be preemptive or non-preemptive. Preemptive, as we have seen in the previous example, when a higher priority process arrives, it's going to get uh, it's going to get the CPU. Uh, Non-preemptive, it means that if a higher priority process arrives, it's going to be placed at the head of the queue. So it will be given priority, but it will not get the CPU immediately. Preemptive means it will get it immediately. Uh, Non-preemptive, it will be given higher, higher priority, but not necessarily immediately. Now, we have already talked about the starvation problem in any 
priority based uh, scheduling algorithm because if uh, higher priority processes keep arriving, lower priority processes may start. And a typical and logical solution to this problem is aging. Aging means you know give more credit or boost the priority of a process as it spends more time in the ready queue so the so that it will eventually uh, get the cpu so give it you know, boost the priority with time okay and in fact we will see that this is something that real systems do example of priority scheduling this example is um, Oh, I think, yeah, I think we missed something with the shortest remaining time first. I think we did not, uh, we did not show the calculations of the average waiting time. So I'm going to do this. Yeah, I think it's important to see how we calculate the average waiting time for this. <coughs> okay, so the average waiting time here Uh, the average waiting time is a little bit tricky compared to the simpler examples that we have seen because we have to take into account two things, preemption and the arrival time. And these make calculating uh, the average waiting time a little bit tricky. Why? Because what's the waiting time of P1 in this case? So we look at the Gantt chart. The waiting time of P1 is the time that P1 spent in the ready queue. What's the time that P1 spent in the ready queue? It's 10 minus 1. So this is the time. During this time, P1 was in the ready queue. So it's going to be 10 minus 1. This is the waiting time of P1, which is 9. Questions on this? Now, what's the waiting time of P2? Zero. zero. It arrives at one, and it got the CPU immediately. So, it's zero. Of course, you know this is an idealization. You know, I, you know, always keep in mind that there is system overhead, and the, you know the kernel will have to intervene, and there is context switching, and all of, all the work that the system will have to do. But we are neglecting this. We are neglecting all of these details, and we are only looking. At the, we are idealizing and simplifying things here. Because in, in real life, it's not going to be a zero. Waiting time of P3. Waiting time of P3 is? 3 minus 2? Yeah, exactly. 17 minus 2. It's going to be 17 minus 2. Why? Because it got the CPU at time 17, while it arrived at time 2, so it spent 15 time units in the ready queue. Okay, now waiting time of P4 is P4 got the CPU at 5, and its arrival time is 3, so it was waiting for 2 time units. Okay. okay, so any questions on how do we calculate the waiting time? Of course, once you get the, the, the waiting time, you just calculate the average. You divide it by four. So just, you know, here, when you do calculations like this, remember, keep in mind, remember preemption and arrival times. You know, preemption, the process that got preempted here is P1, and its waiting time is the time that it's spent <coughs> on the spent in the ready. Okay, so now we get back to this. Now here, with priority scheduling, with times assigned to processes, when we do not specify arrival times, we assume that they all arrive at the same time. When arrival times are not specified, we assume that they arrive at the same time. Uh, of course, in a real system, it's not going to be exactly at the same time 
uh, but we are neglecting the differences in arrival times and assuming that they arrive at the same time. And this may, makes things easier, you know, here, because we have the same arrival time. So the system is just going to look at the priorities, and smaller numbers mean higher priority. So the smallest number is 1, which means P2 gets the CPU first. Then the next smallest number is 2, which means that P5 is going to get the CPU next, and so forth. So this is much easier here. Uh, and you know the average waiting time is straightforward, in fact. So uh, for P1, the waiting time is 6. For P2, it's 0. For P3, it's 16. For P4, it's 18. Uh, because we don't have different arrival times and we don't have preemption here in this example, so calculating the average waiting time is straightforward. This is an oversimplification. I mean, no real system does this, by the way. So uh, when we look at you know, scheduling algorithms in real systems, we will see that real systems use combinations of these basic algorithms that we are studying. So in a real system, there is a combination. Uh, so no real system does this, uh, you know, basic priority scheduling without, uh, without combining it with other things. <coughs> Thank you.